Well, ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much for tuning in this episode of podcast. I'm super excited to have my good friend Daniel to be here. Thank you so much for being here, brother. Thank you for having me. Yeah, I'm, I'm honored to be in your podcast and also in Spain. Absolutely, the pleasure is mine, brother. And before we get into it, do you mind tell us a little bit about yourself? Sure. Yeah. So my name is Daniel Im. I'm the CEO and co-founder of Ubet Sports. Um, I was born in South Korea, and then when I was 11, I moved to Toronto, Canada. Um, I did my middle school, high school, and undergrad university in Toronto as well. And then I moved around a little bit where I did begin my journey to going to Guelph. That's when I did my grad school. Uh, after I finished that, um, I moved to University of Montreal was a visiting researcher for a year there. And um, after that, I moved to Genelia, it's a neuroscience research campus. I studies, studied a little bit of brain, I'm curious about how the, what neuroscientists study. Um, and then I began my startup journey in 2016. And then ever since then, I got into entrepreneurship really um really really got deep and then now somehow i'm here <laughs> nice man i'm glad you made it from the last two weeks hanging with you and traveling together yeah i really appreciate the way you think so with that said you mentioned to me about this puzzle the other day when it comes to burning uh like one hour to burn the rope right oh yeah, yeah one tell us about that puzzle and tell us the answer okay it's 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 like it's a simple riddle nothing like fancy or crazy yeah yeah basically what i asked is okay there is a rope and this rope in total it takes one hour to burn, burn the whole rope yeah but it's not uh, it doesn't even rope burn at a consistent pace so at the beginning maybe it might burn fast slow fast and slow and whatever whatnot and the question i asked you was you need to measure exactly tell me when the 30 minutes passed yes. with this one rope that's all you have and the in the lighter right. so how do you figure out when the exactly 30 minutes is yeah so the answer is oh the answer basically yeah. it's simply if you start the lighter and fire right. and it's gonna burn for an hour right so you put a lighter and you put it at the both sides so that the time that when you meet the two fire right. in the end they touch each other is the time when when it's gonna be at exactly 30 minutes right how many of these puzzles have you gave yourself how many puzzles did i I mean, there's so many puzzles like this. Um, I like to do puzzles. Yeah, yeah, there's a bunch that usually these puzzles are like, um, if you study like a big company interviews, like Google interviews, Microsoft, Apple, and yes. whatnot, then they have a lot of these puzzles. Um, but it's not that I date them to prep for the big company, which I never did or I never applied. I don't like to work for the big co corporations. Right. I like to do my own thing, but I did like doing these puzzles and challenge myself. So, right. So tell us a little bit about, you mentioned 2013, 2014, that's when you got super interested and in dive into the world of entrepreneurship, right? Yeah, 2016, yes. What made you to take that leap? Oh, okay. So, um, we want the story here. Yeah, you want the story? Yeah, so if I keep continuing in academia, so before that, let me step back. I was super into deep learning. I guess this is my first time got into something that I really liked. And that's when in 2012, 2011, when I met um, Jeff Rinton, I took a course in deep learning at University of Toronto. Who is this Jeff? Jeff Rinton, yeah. he's a he's a like a professor who created deep learning. Right. One of the guy who pioneered deep right. learning and um yeah, but for me he was just a professor in undergrad undergrad course and when I took it like blew my mind right. and I just 
fell in love and I keep digging in, digging in more and more and more. Nice. And I try to find a way to study more. That's why I moved to University of Guelph, University of Montreal and New York University nice. to keep studying. And I really love it. I really enjoy it. The, the concept of neuroscience, like a brain inspired machine learning, AI, everything. I really enjoyed it. Nice. Um, so I, I could have kept continued coming back to the entrepreneurship starting how I started. Um, yeah, so I could have kept doing that, but I had a roommate from Netherlands. His name is Harm. Yeah. And he wanted, he, he told me about doing a startup and so on, which I never imagined me doing it. But yes. he, we, we were, we were flatmate and he, he always told me about this in Montreal and I got a little bit curious and then, um, some reason I decided to start it because uh, I thought, oh, I could have started, I could have started PhD right away versus right. I can try a startup. Um, and if I don't like it, then, you know, I don't do it. I come back to academia. Yeah. And I was around 20s, like late 20s, 27, 28, something like that. I don't remember. And then I thought, oh, so if I do startup right now versus I do a PhD, I had to see the opportunity cost. If I do PhD now and then do a startup, then that's five years later. And then I might have a girlfriend or wife or kids or whatever. There's too many dependencies. So I won't be able to do the risk. I don't know what startup I want to do. I don't know anything, but I want to try the taking the risk and when I can actually. And right now was the time that I could have. Yeah. So I decide I, I made uh, small money. I like, I asked my one of friend um, who I met at a start another startup company that I interned when I, right, right after under finishing undergrad, I told Noah, Hey, let's do a startup. Um, here, this is a small money that I gathered that we can start up, start with. Yeah. Let's do it. And we didn't plan that that much. We just do it. <laughs> That's what happened. Right. Describe entrepreneurship in three words. Um, wow. You didn't give me time to think about this. <laughs> <laughs> That's a fun part, man. Um, three words. Yes. Uh, I would say... I do it in two words. Do it. Just problem solving. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I, I think that the big the difference between startup and business is uh I mean when you think about running a company and everything, then there's operations, there's all management and everything. Yeah. And everything, but that's after when you defined when you found business. But a startup you haven't found the business yet, so you're so you're trying to find the business and business to me, business is, uh, simply whatever input that goes in, the output needs to be bigger. Right. Right. That's, that's all it is. doesn't matter. And so it's, uh, again, this is like, in other words, it's called arbitrage and so on, but it's simply how much work, money, time and service, everything I put in as an input, the output needs to be bigger in terms of, you know, in yeah. you know, the dollar units and yeah. if so then we can have a business but yeah. for startups we haven't found this function business function that where it generates bigger up than the input so that's the concept where we constantly have to find it to survive and make it work and then once that works and then you find you define the business and you can figure out how to scale it how to operate it better manage it and so on yeah but for startup, it's a problem solving of how, how to find this F function F, the business function. That's what it is. Now you're on your third startup. Do you have any advice to give it to first time entrepreneurs or entrepreneurs that are hustling, but didn't quite seem to get their first bucket or first success yet? Um, I mean, there is so many advice that I can give or other people can give or because each time I do it, I'm learning something new, something right. that I didn't know about. And, and I just feel that I've learned so much, but 
we but everybody there's there's not a single path solution everybody can do it in their own way to do yes. it like it's not a there is no solution for it yeah so uh, it's hard for me to pin down um like good advice but there's something that i can tell them right um which is one like ideas are cheap don't yeah. think that your idea is so precious and just don't fall in love too much. Don't hide it. Don't tell. Don't be worried that uh, should I tell this idea to somebody or not? Yeah. There's a lot of people who's like, my idea is so good. Should I share it? Should I not share it? Do you not sign my NDA? And yeah, I I think I uh, honestly I think that they're gonna fail if like or, or highly likely that they're gonna fail because ideas are cheap. It's and and just share ideas. If you thought about this idea, there's tons of other people who also thought about your idea as well. Like in this world, you're not the smartest one. Yeah, so ideas are cheap. When you have it, tell people if you really want to do it, you got to tell everybody because there's nothing you can do it by yourself. Tell them that this is what I really want to do. This is, I can, I need help, ask for help. Yeah. Don't forget about NDA or anything. Like just keep telling people what you want to do, what you try to do. And tell them your vision and then try to, yeah, try to get help. Like most people will, a lot of people will help you rather than try to fuck you over. <laughs> Can I say bad words here? Yes, good. Okay. So good. So good. <laughs> okay, good. Love it. Tell us some mistakes or something you have done right when it comes to building a team, scaling your organization or your startup. Okay, the question is how to build a team. Yes. Is that what it is? Yes. Is that what it is? Okay. Yeah. So building a team is so important, I guess. Absolutely. And sometimes like I see like a lot of people, they want to, they start building a team together with their friends or from the lab or whatever. And there's a lot of uh, overlaps, overlap of skills. Right. But I think that's really bad. So, and because um, it's like, with the small, you're, when you start a startup, you're starting with a small team. Right. And you got to do every, everybody has to do everything. And the best way to create a form of members is yes. to maximize the entropy, max, meaning maximize the information of what they can do. So you need to find people who has opposite skills of you. Yeah. Like if I do tech, he can do something that's totally opposite of me. Right. So our skills don't overlap. So... So that we can all help each other and we cover as much of the things that we can do as, as possible. And sometimes if you do that, because we all have a different perspective, different skill set, come from different uh, angles, yeah. there could, it could be harder to compromise and all that, but it's a good sign. Yeah. If there is no argument, if there is no different opinions, there is no uh, hardship of compromising, I think that can be a trap, like... Uh, it's not a good thing. Yeah, there's there's no freelance. There's no easy way. You got to incorporate a lot of ideas, different angles, and, like, communicate. And and you or you derive somewhere. And that usually is a good place. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yes. That, does that make sense? But I would like to dig in just a little bit deeper. Is there a certain kind of quality yeah. or character that you're looking for when you're growing a team? Right. Or hiring a new person. Besides, they gotta have great work ethic. Right? They're willing, they're coachable. They want to learn as much as possible. Yeah. I mean, hiring people is so hard. That's what I'm learning, especially from the startup. Mm -hmm. And I think that um at the beginning, like don't think like you're okay, think like you're forming a Avengers team rather than uh, like an army and you're the commander. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's a bad sign, at least at, at the that? beginning. Because, um, I mean, I think somewhere I, I saw that you want to hire always people who's smarter than you, knows more than you. Absolutely. And who can like, so that's kind of like, uh, that's not, that's very different from building an army and you're being, you being the commander, you know, actually. Yes. Because um, you want to hire people and you're one of the heroes you want all the heroes that can, can come together right. and then they all do their own thing to make the best. And if you do that and then you guys can 
like together as a team will be able to solve a problem, problem solving again, coming back to problem solving. Right. Whereas if you're the commander and you hire people and they just are doing what they, what, what they're, what you told them to do and so on, right. you're making all the decisions and you're the only guy who's problem solving and it's hard at the, it's, it's, it's good for being a, for large company operating skills and me, fast pace moving and stuff. But at the beginning, if you want to solve a problem, you want to bring as much as brain as possible or yeah. Tell us a bit about the problem that you bet is solving. Okay. So it's just to let you know, you bet is a, a decentralized sports book and, or uh, another way you can think of it as a, it's a decentralized exchange, just like any trading platform that are decentralized, except that we are applying for sports. So because in this decentralized exchange where you trade, we put the sports data and it's what comes a sports trading, sports betting. If you put the spot market data, then you're trading spot uh, equity or shares or crypto. If you put derivative data, market data, then you're doing derivative trading. And here we have built um, sports betting, sports book. And I think it's one of the necessary one because in traditional sports betting world, there are many things that are um, um, that give you like a lot of bad user experience. Yes. One is um, uh, the odds are constantly being being manipulated, yes. like the betting odds. Two, um, two, um, because yeah, it's a non it's a custodial service where you as a better give your money to the platform, and then platform may even if you want platform might not give you the money back and this is happy you, you can see you see this a lot in in everywhere in social media this guy he won like crazy parlay bet they he wants to pay out because he won a lot but then the sports book um they deny it they don't they like oh you can't take that you can't take out that money you know so there's whole this problem whereas we make it non-custodial means that you're still holding money on your pocket. You're not giving your money to platform or other central middleman entity. You're talking directly to the peer-to-peer -peer, like network, mm -hmm. decentralized blockchain network. So whenever you bet and you win, you get your money back directly to your wallet, yeah. right? Yeah. So there is no um, way for some middleman to fuck you up and not pay you back even though you, you won. So that's another big thing. And other things that is another thing that inspired me to do going this way is that in traditional finance world, like everybody's like, like fighting for the best technology to have a little bit of more advantage, you know, like in, especially in high frequency trading or even quant trading or even like fundamental trading, everybody's fighting to get best, better information, better way to edge to win. Right. So the because they're competing nonstop, you know the technology and everything is constantly innovating. Yeah. Whereas sports betting, their tech, their business, their tech, everything's ancient, and they're using really old school technology and so on. So we thought we can bring it a lot of new tech, new ways of doing things in this field, and we thought we can innovate it. And so we thought this is a really good place to start. That's interesting. The last couple of days during the conversation, we talked a lot about Africa and Latin America market. Yes. Tell us a bit about the opportunities and challenges being as you grow, you bet and expand users across the world. Yes. Um, I think that I want to say that I'm an idealist and realist. If I was realist, then I would, you know, try to like, Imagine all the things that you need to foresee. I wouldn't be able to stop but I'm an idealist. It, you know, we tried first. Yeah. So in, in like, I decided to go to like African market, Indian market or other emerging markets like Philippines or in India and so on. And I just started it because, um, um, actually, okay, let me take that, go back a little bit. So. I, I attend this, I, we attended as a company, um, NYU Accelerator, 
And at that time, we were trying to, it's all, in this accelerator, it's all about finding product market fit and so on. Right. And basically, we need to find the target audience, the, the right demographics and so on. Yes. And on the way, um, was I'm not, Alex there? what? Was Alex there? Oh, yeah, Alex was there remotely, not physically. Yeah, um, nice. But I was there remotely. And here, I'm not coming from the marketing or like this background. So it, this one, and I, all my previous um, work businesses were B2B, not B2C. So it's oh, nice. another new consumer B2C challenge for me, right? So I, I was having a little bit of like contemplation. How do I do this? How, what's the right move? And I create some options and try to, but this need to make a decision in the end and so on. And we had this one mentor, um, I'm sorry, I forgot his name, but he's, he's a professor at Columbia, marketing, pro digital marketing professor at right. Columbia. But he, whenever we meet, he always make it sound so easy. <laughs> and he make it sound so easy that I, I just had to like, you know, try it. And then, you know, I feel like I can do it because it sounds so easy. Yeah. Um, what do you say? Um, I can't remember exactly, but, um, type of things he make it sounds like, Oh, you gotta do this. You gotta do this. You get in and it will automatically do it. You gotta, you gotta frame it. Like he gave me a lot of example. You gotta in Twitter, you gotta use all this, uh, um, very controversy topic. If you say it this way, then th this is how people will engage. How do you get emails? How do you want, if you know the email campaign, how do you get all the emails? How do you get the right target audience? And he got all, he has so many tricks like that. And then he just make, he just tell me, yeah, if you want, for example, you want, you want, you want betters, but they need to have a crypto wallet or what blockchain wallet. How do you get there? How do you find the ones that have wallets? He's like, oh, you go to, why don't you just go to Coinbase and people see all the followers that um that follow coinbase because then they're all crypto people they must have wallets and so on so he has he has all these tricks that like yeah, i can rewind like, re-engineer yeah. to get there yeah like and, growth hacks right? yeah all the growth hack tricks that he knows mm -hmm. and he made it sound easy and so i'm like okay let me try it myself um so um so first we decide to go to nigeria um and see a how we can perform and the idea was to uh, actually for us to learn learn how to do product market fit there and with the uh, with um you know being a little bit of um um saving money at the same time and also they're like super nigerian nigeria is a really big sports betting market they're expert when i did the, a lot of user interviews in nigeria they're they're more in average i would say more like uh, in sports intelligent than average US people um, in terms of betting because they bet a lot, they watch all the sports and so on. So I thought it was a good place to start and learn and have the learning curve from there. Also, I bet they're eager to do something they enjoy doing, but also at the same time as opportunity to make some money, right? Compared to the Europe and America, I would say. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Like, like here, there, there isn't much more. There, there isn't a lot of opportunities as much as um, um, there should be. Uh, and my interaction with these um Nigerians, at least, is that they're very passionate. They're very um opportunity hungry. Uh, whenever um there is an opportunity, they'll say yes. They're basically yes when they can do it. Um, and they'll. With what they can do, they'll try hard, and yeah. So and in in Africa, especially in Nigeria, and just in Africa general, like seventy percent of the populations are aged between fifteen to thirty, so very young populations, and they're great and and they're very enthusiastic, sports passionate, high sports IQ. They like betting. They want to make money from betting. So, yeah, perfect audience for me. Sounds like one of the audience should do a dating app in Africa, right? Because that would be popping. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's, that's for you to do, right? Like, <laughs> I got plenty on my play. We'll see. Oh, you gotta, you gotta, you gotta make it happen. <laughs> <laughs> B 
before you started UBAT, how did you get started in crypto? When was the first time you heard about it? Mm -hmm. I got I got in in crypto in 2017. Nice. Um, at that time, I actually don't know anything about crypto, nor even trading, nor even like right. like finance, anything about finance, nothing. Right. <laughs> um, Actually, like when I first got to know about crypto was 2014, 15. Yeah. I had a friend, his name's Ethan Butchman. He's a co-founder of uh, Cosmos and Contenderment. Yeah. And he was, uh, we were a lab mate and he sat next to me. And he was always, he was so crazy about crypto. He was always like talking about that, trying to explain me how to start uh, my own tokens and he was talking about Bitcoin, PP coin, and a bunch of other things. Right. But I, and that's when I got to know about it. But then I was so into deep learning, machine learning that... Um, you didn't even want to hear it. I hear it, but then I'm like, whatever. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but in 2017 is when I got in and I was more... In, I, I learned about it. I played with my friends a little bit. Like I was doing swing trading. It was so fun because it was only going up until it, 2008 crashed. Yeah. But um, I, I also started coding about programming about arbitrage trading. Yes. Um, so the bots you built? Yeah, the bots. At that time, it's a different bot, bot, bot system because I just began. And the opportunity that I tried to see was that in, in Korea versus Canada or US, um, there is something called Kimchi Premium where like a coin, like so for example, IOTA or something like that was like way more expensive than in Korea than Canada or US. Right. So I wanted to buy a lot from Korea and then I spot, buy a lot from US yes. and then sell it in South Korea and then somehow and repeat that <laughs> process. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, it didn't go well because... Um, one is how do you bring the money back nice. and also um, always money gets transferred into one sided rather than equal balance like arbitraging like always there's a one exchange that's always where all the money goes to and then you have to manually move them and so on nice. but it was really fun then that's when i got in um yeah how much was bitcoin when you got in oh uh like at that time, it was like 13 k -ish. 13 k -ish. Yeah. Nice. Yeah. <laughs> Are you a Bitcoin ETH Maxi or? Oh, I don't think, I'm I'm not a Bitcoin Maxi, I'm ETH Maxi. You're an ETH Maxi? Yeah. You're not UBAT Maxi? I, I'm UBAT Maxi too. Nice. <laughs> yeah. Where do you see the future of crypto industry in the next 5, 10 years? Oh, wow. Um... To be honest, I'm not too sure. Are we going to meme coin ourselves to death or there going to be some finally big, interesting and potentially entertainment related breakthrough that leads to mass adoption? Yeah, so one, like looking at like predicting, speculating what's going to happen in future next is very hard. Even next five, year, five years is very foggy. Like it's very hard to oh. predict. So... I mean, I can only see what I can see like like six months or three yeah. months, six months or a year. Yeah. I do think that I always thought that uh, even a long time ago until now that crypto is not for developed countries. So I thought that it will never pick up in US. I thought that it will not pick up in South Korea or Canada and so on. Yeah. Um, uh, it's more for developing countries, which is another reason why I went to Africa, India, Nigeria, and so on too, Absolutely. right? Because like it's it, the the philosophy behind it is uh decentralizing, getting rid of the middleman in business, government, everywhere. Like, and in developing in developed world world like like U.S., they don't want to give up their power, authority of doing things. It's completely opposite of what they are doing and you are going against it, yeah. obviously, you more you push, it's going to backfire even harder, just like you see nice. last few, last two years. So I don't think crypto is meant for developed countries unless something happened and then, and then they decide to adopt, let's do it because um, 
because there's some kind of uh, um, destruction in the monetary system in our in our in our banking system or like currency system. But I think that's much more for developing country as always. I yeah now and even past now in future, like Venezuela. Nigeria, Ghana, you Argentina. know, Argentina, and so on. Like all these inf- country, they have very infl- Their currencies are very inf- inflationary, right? Yeah. Even last year in Argentina, their their Argentina token and uh, currency um, inflated a hundred times, right? Of before in within a year, right? Yeah. So who would want to hold like their currency, like right? Like El Salvador, you know, like. It's crazy that they they went to Bitcoin. I agree, but if you look at Latin America, everybody comes to U.S. during the summer or winter, and then they work hard and they send their money back to Latin America, right? Yes. And then if you look, and then and they take so much commissions on the way to send their like convert. Mm. It, I like I hate exchange rates in banking. Like they, yeah. whenever I change from Canadian to U.S., I lost so much money. And then that's that was, that's only one step. And then from there, you you're trying to take up money through some app, and they take another commission and so on. Right. And these are like places where you need really need where, um, yeah, this cryptocurrency, the app, decentralized app system. Like I talked to another guy in Cameroon. Like I told him he we had a conversation because he was a part of our community member in our UBET. Yeah, and. It's not like Nigeria. In Nigeria, uh, there is like a ways to convert from fiat to crypto and so on. But in, in Cameroon, they use another currency that I forgot that it's more widely used in throughout Africa. But to convert that to crypto, they have to go through multiple layers and each layer adds, they take 20% commission, like another commission, another commissions. And by the time your money shrunk, <laughs> by the time you, you, you exchange, it yeah. just doesn't make sense, right? So yeah. there, it, it's it's different. Like if you like, when I interact only with Americans because I live in U.S. and Canada, right? Versus, and I that's all I know about. Versus now, I after I go into these countries and I talk to them a lot, and with problems that they tell me what they're facing, it's completely different. <laughs> it's like. Yeah. Two worlds. Yeah, it's right. two worlds. So, yeah. um, I think that it's way more. Which which leads to their needs, what they want, and what they really care about are extremely different, right? Yes, yes. So nobody will convert if it's not needs. If it's like alternative, it's gonna be very hard conversion from traditional right. web two to web three. Yeah. Like if I if I'm already satisfied, it, like why would I go move like unless there's a big incentives? But if it's if it's must, I need to do this like Argentina, Venezuela, and so on, Colombia, and so on. Like then, the people yeah. do it. Yeah. So I think that I see more bright futures in there in that side of world. Yeah. Especially the politics is really um, corrupted in Africa or Latin America or a bunch of emerging markets. And I think that there can be a big movement. Is it crowded in Korea? Um, I don't know much about Korean politics. I don't even know the name of the Korean president. So right. I don't, I really don't know the name of the president in Korea. So I, I'm not going to say anything. Yeah. yeah. Um, with what you just said, I don't think there are actually data to back this up, but in comparison, let's say US, Canada, Europe versus the emerging markets, right? I had a feeling that from the developed countries versus the developing countries, the developed countries, they will more likely to get into some projects just because of there's crazy airdrops opportunities, right? And then these group of people are more likely to do pump and dump. Yeah. I'm not going to say that the from the developing country, they are not going to do that, but they have stronger needs to try on these dApps to actually use them. 
I, yeah, I, in my opinion, I think airdrop and pump and dump, whether it's developing or developed, it's going to come. It's, it's like because you give a lot of airdrops. So now the, you, yeah. you, you fucked up with the supply and demand. Right. So it's a, it's a heck way to do airdrops to get, attract a lot of users. But then as soon as you launch, they're going to all dump. I mean, that's what, so yeah. it, it, it's regardless of developing or developed, maybe developed country, developing country, they want more because they want, they need free more money. Yeah. They want free money, but it's not a sustainable way. Airdrops, um, looking for bounty hunters. It's not a sustainable way. Right. You need to, you really, you should really think about an ecosystem where the supply and demands are ba well balanced if you want to succeed your project in a way that you are proud of rather than doing pump and dump airdrop just get and things, just early get quick yeah get thing get rich quick <laughs> get rich quick and get coming get, quick so they yeah. can raise the next round so that's not a that's not a healthy way I, I, um definitely i am not into those stuff right that's extremely interesting what you just said, right? But it seemed to me, because as a marketing profession, because for me as a mark, as someone who is doing Web3 marketing, a lot of new projects, they're still mainly aimed towards, let's say, the Europe and US and Canada markets. So I just think that's, with what you according to what you just said if they still only so fix it on that market the conversion rate it would be lower if they spend the same amount of resources let's say go to the emerging markets would you say that applies to all DeFi projects or could you could you explain a little bit more like you're explaining to six years old <laughs> yes absolutely what's your experience so far would you say which one's more effective to gain more users, actually real users, if they spend that 10 or 100K on developed countries or emerging markets? Mm, I think it's case by case. It's not, it's hard to say which there is a solution for single, like depending on what DeFi app it is or what DEX it is and uh, who you're targeting and what, yeah, what goods and services that you bring to your audience. Right. Um, for trading stuff, in the end, the volume matters because, like, you're in the end, you're taking the commission of the from the total volume, right? Right. So, I mean, you target richer countries, then it will, and they, and if you can maintain a high trading volume, that's good for you. Um, but. At the beginning, if you're a project that haven't found the product market fit, and you, if your goal is to get a lot of users and see, test it out and see if it's really their needs, then it can be anywhere, even developing countries and so on. Right. Daniel, tell us about how you only eat one meal a day. Oh, uh, yeah. I mean, sometimes I eat two meals a day. I try to eat one meal a day, but um, I try to slowly reduce more and more. Um, right. I feel better eating less. Um, yeah. When if I eat three meals a day, then you know um, I'm not if being I'm not efficient during the day. Especially if I skip lunch, I I feel the best because I don't feel sleepy. Right. My biggest obstacle is like around two o'clock where I I have to fight with myself to stay awake. To stay awake, and and eat. also you don't do. Caffeine. You don't even drink tea. Yeah, I don't drink tea. I don't drink coffee. I don't do Adderall or I don't do any anything. Nothing. Only ice creams. Yeah, only sugar. <laughs> A lot of sugars, but <laughs> do do you not have the sugar crush? Uh, uh, hard to say. I'm addicted for sure. You're addicted. Yeah, but I don't do other things. <laughs> Um, but even if I stay awake at 2, 2 p.m., I'm not being efficient because I'm just fighting myself. Like, right. whereas if I'm, if I skip that meal, I just keep continuing what I'm doing without being sleepy. I just keep focusing and I realize, oh shit, it's 4, 5 p.m. already. That's a good sign. That means that I was fo so focused that I didn't know that, that the time passed by. Yeah. So 
skipping meals really helps. I like it. Yeah, fair enough. I also cut. Um, I used to eat a lot of toast in the morning, like breads. Right. And with butter or with olive oil, like how we do it. Oh, uh, peanut butter sandwich mostly. Oh, with banana or not? No, it's strawberry jam and a lot of peanut butters. PB and J, right? Yeah. Oh. But then I quit. I quit bread in eating in the morning. I still eat when I go out, but at home in the morning, and I also feel a lot better too. Only bread in Europe, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Spain is feeding me a lot of bread. Um, yeah. yeah. Um, but I like it without it. It's not like I. It's I cut it out. Yeah. I eat whatever whenever I go out and eat. Yes. But and a lot, and I eat a lot. Yeah, I eat a lot. You know, even if when I take one meal, it's okay. Nice. It's yes. okay. Yes, I want to dig in a bit more when you say that when you are so focused and from two to four five, right? In from psychology, there's a concept called the flow. So, on top of that, you have great work ethic. You can be super focused on working on what you're doing, and also you have great work ethic. I think those are very important traits for any person, especially when it comes to entrepreneurs, right? Where did you get that work ethic? Where? Okay. Yeah. Well, I don't know if I, how good my work ethic is. It's like a relative thing, or. Hard to say, but um, um, I try. I try to. F- I think I one thing I'm good at is focusing. Right. But bad thing is that means I'm also bad at multitasking. <laughs> so I can't do multitasking at all. Uh, I can only do one thing at a time. Um, yeah. Um. I think it comes with the like your attention span. Um. Funny thing is. When when I'm in quiet place, I have a much shorter work uh, attention span. I have a stronger attention span, but that doesn't last long. Whereas I'm in this noise place, then I get into uh I focus more more and a lot bit longer. Like it's not like this noise bother me. It it becomes silent. Like even though there is noise, like I don't hear anything. Like it's like a <laughs> Uh, hypnosis, right? Yeah. Where it just helped me to join focus in. Same thing, like I realized that when I'm sleeping, if I turn on the movie, I sleep a lot better. It's not that I don't hear them. It's just a, uh, it's like a red sun. It's that, like a white noise, right? It's a white noise that get me into the zone. But I don't, it doesn't bother me. I don't hear anything. No noise, no TV, nothing. Like, right. it, yeah. It, it somehow triggers me to get into that zone. Yeah. Who's gonna come? Who's gonna come? Yeah, if the, all the human is human humanity is gone, who's gonna come? Is it alien or what? What's yeah, that? alien or your future wife? She's gonna okay read it. But you know, this is like that. <laughs> this is the type of question. It's like, uh, what would you leave to the world? Like on this piece of paper, what would you want to tell to the world? Um, I guess. I have maybe some kind of sign that we existed. I think that's a natural instinct. Um, yeah. Because like, what exactly I, you are going to write on that piece of paper? Oh, what exactly? Pushing push you to the corner here, bro. Thanks. Um. Well, I don't even know if they speak the same language, so. Assuming they also speak English. Okay. Or Korean. Okay. 
Okay, in that case, um, I think I will write how, why, and how the world is ended. Okay, you wouldn't write anything about yourself. No, okay. no, I'm I'm not the center of the world. Like I'm just, <laughs> I'm just a small matter. But um, I'll say I think it's important to leave, like why why the humanity is extinct and what was the reason, and yeah. kind of to let them be aware of this happened cool yeah something like that yeah then a different question how do you want i, I think i keep I, I try to write as much as possible about like the history like how long the world existed and when what era like okay, historians no no not, not the whole history of like what happened fight it's more like a like a yeah. cat catastrophic yeah. history of the all the catastrophic like events that happened so that maybe nice. that helps um it could be like, oh, like a global warming or how the ice age happened or like why, yeah. what, 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 or what's the impact of like technology advancement that impacts the, the earth, earth health, like, yeah. Just like how do you want the world? How do you want to be remembered? <laughs> Me? <Yeah. laughs> um... How do I want to be remembered? As a formal K-pop star. Turn no. to a CEO. No, who's that? <laughs> um, who's that? Who? <laughs> <laughs> who? Oh, I'm, I don't think I'm so attached to be remembered or anything. Um, if if I want to do your business, Ryan, grow and... Maybe move on to the next thing and or just be so focused at what you're doing and Oh okay, okay, I know. I think I know what I want. I don't care about with either if whether I'm if I'm remembered or if I am um like leave a history or anything, like it doesn't matter for me. But what I would care is all the ideas that I want to implement in this world or all the ideas, all the things that that I feel like it's a good idea or in, at least intriguing for me, I write the ideas down so that somebody else can execute. Ooh. Yeah. Does awesome. that make sense? It makes perfect sense. Yeah. Well, thank you so much, brother, for getting on this podcast. Okay. Thank you. We're going to do this again, maybe in France or Estonia. Yeah, sounds good. I'm, I'm always down. I'm thank definitely you. in New York. Thanks. Thank you. Thanks. Look at the camera and tell us where people could follow you and UBAD, the usernames. Right. Okay. UBAD is a Web3 decentralized sports betting platform. We also have esports as well, like Dota 2, League of Legends, uh, Valorant, and um, Counter Strike. Um, you, can, you can look it up, ubetsports.io. That's our website name. And if, please follow us at Twitter and YouTube and Instagram. Thank you.